It's Dr. Scott Watson, and uh, I was asked to give a little background on how I got to be a composer, um, and I thought that uh, this video might be useful for some of the schools I work with who are interested in a little information on my background, and also um, for any of the Skyping that I do, um, this might be a good video to, to play to give just a sense of um, you know, what you need to do to become a composer. So the, the topic here is uh, how did I get to be a composer, <laughs> and that's... Um, there's, there's so many ways that different, very, very talented and wonderful composers get to where they are. Um, so I'm not saying that this is the only way to do it, I'm just telling my story, okay? Um, I started writing probably in high school, just fiddling around on this piano we had in our basement. And uh, it was an old clunker. Um, I remember there was uh, some talent shows where I got a, a little band of classmates together and, and arranged some music and we played that. And I remember uh, writing some pet music that we played in the stands for um, my high school marching band. Uh, that was at Westchester East High School in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Um, but I especially remember when my girlfriend broke up with me in high school, fiddling around on the piano and, and writing this uh, very emotional, melodramatic, uh, sad piece uh, that was my way of pouring out my angst, my teenage angst. <laughs> um, so anyway, from there, I went to college uh, to be a music teacher. Um, I actually wanted to perform. Um, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, boy, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could be the principal trumpet player of the Philadelphia Orchestra, replacing then trumpeter Frank Katarabic. Um, boy, was that a pipe dream. I was an okay trumpet player, not, not that good. Uh, but during my undergraduate years, really trying hard to be a good performer and uh, really fully engaged in all the, the, the wonderful classes at Westchester University, where I went to school in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Um, I remember getting the composition bug a little bit more formally than those high school fiddlings. Um, and what a great place to, to get that bug. At Westchester University, there were so many student and um, university ensembles that were open to playing music that uh, an undergraduate like me would write. So for instance, I wrote for the flute ensemble, for my own brass quintet, for my own brass quartet. Um, for the chamber orchestra, there was a music theory composition uh, contest that um, I won or came in second place or something like that and, and got a, a performance there. Um, just friends that would, you know, hey, a flute player, would you play a piece I wrote? Sure, you know, that kind of thing. Um, eventually, though, uh, the wind ensemble played one or two pieces of mine. And my first commission was actually, um, as a senior at Westchester, they were um, installing a new president. And I think Perrin was his name. And the head of the School of Music came to me and said, hey, uh, they, they want an original piece to be played at his inauguration. Would you write a piece? So I, I got a commission to write a piece for the, uh, the symphony orchestra at Westchester, which was played there. Not a specially memorable piece. It hasn't been published. I haven't really used it since then. But it was just a good opportunity to hear my music uh, being played. So anyway, just uh, an aside there is I would really recommend anybody thinking about a career in composition unless you are really, really a singular talent um, in your generation. I, I'm not really a big fan of sending people to undergraduate composition degrees. I much more prefer that they would go to school and get um, two things. One is solid, solid um, fundamentals, you know, harmony, ear training, all that kind of stuff, music history, which I felt like I did get at Westchester. And the other thing is, which you don't find at a lot of undergraduate schools anymore, is a school that's more liberal arts oriented and has the flexibility for students to experiment and just engage in free time where they can pursue some of these uh, things that are interesting to them. And unfortunately, um, many of our undergraduate music ed programs are just overwhelmingly packed with um, jumping through a lot of hoops. I'm not complaining about those hoops. I'm just saying they're, they're not the place to just um, explore, uh, unfortunately. So anyway, um, I wanted to take composing to the next level. Um, I had thought about being a teacher, but um, decided to put that on hold and um, just study composition as, uh, right, right away in a master's program rather than, say, going and, and getting a teaching job. Um, I did have one professor, uh, Dr. Sterling Murray, my music history professor, who actually kind of wisely said, you know, why don't you take what, what is now would be known as a gap year. Uh, but at the time it was thought about like, like goofing off for a year or something. Uh, so I didn't actually seriously consider it. But what he said is, why don't you just go find a good composition teacher, take lessons and study scores, you know, just go and ravenously, uh, you know, just look at a lot of different pieces of music that you admire and figure out how it works. Well, what, what a great um, recommendation that would have been. Um, however, I ended up going on for my master's degree right away 
at Temple University. And, and to be honest with you, Temple University was a great um, master's program. And my teacher and mentor there, Dr. Morris Wright, um, shepherded me through like a great time of um, just uh, get, moving to the next level as a composer. So I'm, I'm not sorry I did that. But um, while I was a master's um, student there, I also got married. Um, and, um, you know, so I wrapped that up and pretty much went on to a uh, uh, teaching career, uh, teaching band, which I had always wanted to do, or at least see if I wanted to do it. Um, and um, after a few years of teaching, I decided I kind of liked it, but I, I wanted to go back and get my doctorate, so I did that. Um, I ended up switching jobs from being a, a very, very busy high school band director to uh, being an elementary school instrumental music teacher, which gave me some flexibility in my schedule. So I was kind of teaching full-time during the day, going to school part-time at night, and um, over the course of eight years, it took her seven and a half years, I got my doctorate in composition. And um, I have to say, uh, when I got done that degree, um, or during that degree, and then shortly after that degree, I did have a lot of wonderful opportunities to write for very, very talented friends of mine, um, you know, that were excellent musicians that would play music I wrote. And also I started getting some um, commissions and even winning some competitions, some prizes, where part of the, the prize, in addition to maybe some cash, was also a performance by a really good uh, ensemble. And those recordings uh, ended up being very useful um, in moving my composition uh, degree on, or career on. So anyway, um, after I got out of uh, Temple, um, I did, and, and some other opportunities I had that were not uh, the kind of music I write now, um, writing for media, for instance, I got to write some music for a software company, um, I got to write some music for a radio theme, um, I, I wrote some music, incidental music for a play in the Philadelphia area, some you know, background music that would happen, and so they were all great um, um, chances to explore and some neat opportunities, but um, my composing as a career really wasn't it was just basically like a little bit of a hobby and um, I just continued teaching um, it wasn't until I had taught about 15 years believe it or not that some I encountered different people um, don't have time to tell you the stories here but I suddenly um, had this a realization you know I'm a composer and I'm a teacher why don't I write for my students? <laughs> I hadn't really been doing that. Um, I'd been doing composing kind of like a night job or something outside of school. Um, I, I had been using technology a lot in, more and more in my teaching. And that I started doing when I was probably in my doctoral program or my master's program. That's when I really you know, became enthralled with all the great technology uh, to both record and typeset music. So I was using that in my teaching, but it took me till about 15 years of teaching, you know, half my career basically, um, to decide to write for my own students. And and that really did unlock some things because um, I was able to submit some of those pieces to publishers and they started getting some attention. Um, I was a freelance composer just sending in scores to different publishers and they would take some of them and, and some publishers would take them, some wouldn't. Um, got published by about six different companies actually um, before one company, Alfred, uh, sort of uh, took me under their wing. and. Um, their first, uh, my first concert band editor there was John O'Reilly, and then Robert Sheldon was hired later to replace him uh, when he retired. And, and Robert Sheldon's been sort of like a, a mentor to me as well. Um, and so I've I've come become more of a, a, an exclusive composer. In fact, that's the the role, the title, um, exclusive composer for Alfred. And I write for um, several of their series, and I have assignments I do every every year, some assignments. And I've gotten more and more commissions from school ensembles, high school bands, middle school bands, elementary school bands. Here and there, um, uh, an independent um, you know, like a community band or a university band, too. Um, anyway, so that's sort of my journey. Uh, I will say two lessons that I um, really valued and, and I'm glad I learned along the way that I'll share with you um, was, number one, um, to take risks. Because several times, like going for my DMA when I was teaching full-time, had a wife and two kids, that was very risky. And I didn't know if we could afford it. I didn't know if I'd have the time to do it, but I'm really glad I did it. Opened a lot of doors. Um, I took a year off, actually, from my teaching job to teach full-time at Temple University after I got my doctorate. Um, and that was a risk because I didn't know if I'd be able to come back to Temple. I mean, come back to Parkland where I'm a, a music teacher and it, it all worked out. But but it was a, a great, valuable year of uh, teaching music theory at the collegiate level. Um, and um, some of the risks involve approaching editors and being confident enough to um, to say, hey, you really should look at this score. I think I, I believe it would you know, do well for your company and, and just kind of putting yourself out there a little bit. So that's the one thing. The other thing is to be entrepreneurial. Um, very early on, I think even late 90s, I had a website up, um, uh, uh, 
giving away music in that website. Uh, I called it Home Practice Online, but I would also pub- self-publish my own um, school band music, and I would send that around to directors, but I would make it available. They could download the music for free on that website, and that just sort of spread my brand and things like that. Um, going to conferences, um, to spending a little bit of my own money, in a sense, to go to a, a music conference or um, and do a presentation about some topic, but then you know, just getting my name out there. So I do think being entrepreneurial and taking risks is, is um, an important part of the, the journey. Uh, but you got to have the goods too. Yeah. And that goes all the way back to where I started about getting a good, solid, fundamental uh, education and then, um, you know, starting to hone your craft. Anyway, uh, hopefully this um, journey of my story uh, is helpful to some of you out there. And remember, there's many, many ways. Um, a lot of great friends of mine, writers, um, wonderful writers, um, have had all sorts of different paths to getting to where they are. And, and their music's uh, very meaningful and thoughtfully written, and they just came from a different experience. So there, there is certainly not just one way to do it, but, but that was my way. <laughs>